so this is uh, lightning talks uh, again this is a last minute impromptu thing that we thought would be great we've always had lightning talks at agile india conference and we wanted to do one this year as well uh, so the concept with lightning talks is basically these are very short uh, three minute talks uh, and this is a great way for uh, you know anyone to share their ideas uh, and present to a greater forum uh, especially if you are a first time speaker it's a great way to get up there and speak and present and kind of uh, you know be heard uh, what i would request you is if you want to come up and speak then please use the q and a uh, tab and propose your topic as a question like you use just the q and a it doesn't have to be a question but propose a topic using the q and a uh, i'll select the topic uh, based on the number of likes uh, in case we have too many topics we cannot fit everybody then we'll use the likes and then once your topic is uh, picked i will call out your name uh, and you uh, just raise the hand uh, if you can see the raise hand you raise the hand and then i can bring you on stage and you can present the topic okay you can choose to use slides you could choose to ignore uh, and just uh, present the topic without slides it's up to you uh, you know it's uh, whatever makes you comfortable great this is uh, such an awesome crowd i see four topics there yeah so we will get started and maybe uh, you know more people will get encouraged when they see some of them uh okay keep hitting those like buttons and we'll get started cool so uh i think the the one with the highest likes is the empathy one so uh, babita if you are in the audience can you please uh, put up your hand and i will bring you on stage hello yes hi babita thank you uh thanks for proposing a very important topic i think empathy is uh, extremely important so uh i'm going to set my timer for 3 minutes uh, are you going to do slides or are you just going to talk i'm just going to talk perfect take it away yeah thank thank you everyone for voting that empathy is the word that i have learned um, a long back when one of the my one of my team leader who used to talk more about this uh, empathy word but i started to feel it recently when i have taken the role of scrum master and for to understand people more now i'm trying to relate it to my daughter as well while living with her all the notice stuff what i observed with this is that when someone is being emotional very very emotional that is being because of the work that we are doing or because of the little kid who has been hurt from someone or want something what i observed they don't need any of your advice they they don't need what solution you are up to and what that can solve your problem what i observed is they need listening them out you listen to whatever they have try asking them what more they have what happened then what happened then until they calm down to tell you all the problem that they have faced i feel that at that moment and you go and share what you have something that you could help them out and that's when they open up open up their mind and uh, listen to you and then maybe they could think the problem or whatever with a different direction altogether so that that's what was my learning i thought maybe i it will be happy to share that i i don't think i'll need three more minutes <laughs> thank you okay great so empathy and uh, you know what you what you talked about is uh, you know do, people don't need advice or any of that stuff you know uh, the, so that's uh, great uh, cool thanks uh, babita i think uh, next up we have uh, is uh, fancy uh, who wants to talk about uh, stop using the term agile with customers uh, so uh, fancy if you can put up your hand or actually fancy can join directly either way is fine <laughs> so i i actually wanted to encourage people to put up topics and that's the only reason why i did this some enemies of mine over here just hit like over there but okay since i am on the stage and i'm on the screen let me just um so we had this discussion earlier in the morning today i, I don't know if sri devi and lakshman are listening to this uh but we spoke spoke about uh customers being walked down by this term called agile so every time we use this term different people perceive it differently 
we uh, so we spoke about mindset and all that so i don't want to go into that but i felt and i think i'm doing it for quite some time now i stopped using any agile terminologies or the term itself in front of customers because they hear a lot about agile in the market they 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 want to do agile but they don't know uh, they or even we are not experts we are all learning right we are here to learn so i think we should slow down on using that terminology or using agile terminologies with customers and slowly start um using facts instead to prove the point if you are if you really want to be agile it actually means that mindset of doing things and adapting to change quickly right if you understand that part of agile you really don't have to prove your point by putting words into their mind instead just show them the results show them facts and slowly they'll start getting used to it uh, so i want to um, share a very personal um 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 i wouldn't say a story but something that happened to me off late uh, there was a there was a, a client who heard this term and wanted to use it into their projects and said that um, if you get this done for us uh, it's it, you know it's it's going to be project after project so everybody wanted to showcase that they are agile they are agile i i i know this i know that but the problem that happened is the person who actually proposed the project the client did not know anything about it so if you if slowly we started showing results which actually helped him understand what it meant what we meant we brought him to uh, we brought him into demos product demos and it was a product so slowly he started understanding what it meant so um my general opinion maybe it's just a thought that i want to put out there is stop using the word agile or anything to do with agile just out there with the customers because for them um you know, especially people who are completely into into the business side of it they might not understand the technicality behind it but they would love to see results and facts i'm done naresh awesome <laughs> so results over terminology yes please <laughs> all right thank you pixie all right uh, i am going to go next and then uh, there are uh, this uh, one other topic after that but uh, you know folks please go ahead and uh, propose your topics uh, we're going to bring you up on stage so i'm going to quickly uh, go next and so my topic is uh, after about uh, after evangelizing uh, tdd for about 10 plus years uh, and maybe practicing it for 15 years uh, why i stopped tdd uh and what is what are the lessons i learned after i stopped tdd uh so the first thing that uh, i basically uh discovered is when i would uh, when i was doing tdd uh, i've got quite proficient with it uh i was able to get away with lot more complexity uh you know when when i was doing tdd i could my code could be fairly sophisticated fairly you know dense and complex and i could get away with it because i had the safety net of tdd and somewhere deep down i felt like basically uh, you know one of the core principles that we always strive towards is uh, simplification and simplifying things uh, and so this started a bit contradicting with it and this is again one of the places where i moved away from object orientation and got influenced by functional programming and so i started writing more a uh, functional uh, code if you will uh, trying to embrace simplification and minimalism so that's like the first uh, you know problem that i saw that i could get away with complexity i had the safety net of those tests and i could do that uh, and then basically when i stopped tdd immediately hit me that you know i no longer have that safety net i cannot write complex code uh, so i really need to focus on simplicity and uh, you know functional programming to some extent was kind of at risk for me uh, the second thing that uh, was was bothering me for quite some time and i mentioned this today in the keynote as well is uh, you know I, i often kept making the statement that code is a liability uh, code is not an asset code is a liability and you need to be throwing away code uh, you need to invest less in code and throw it away more frequently uh, which allows you to experiment more uh so when you do tdd when you write very elegant code and you uh, you start getting attached with with the whole thing uh, uh you know and so when you stop writing tests you don't have that safety net and you also want to experiment more uh of course you can't afford to throw away everything uh 
but you have to now start becoming extra careful of, of how you will decouple your code uh, because then you can throw away small parts of the code, not the whole thing. Uh, and, you know, you can move away from that attachment and sunk costs, which plays on your mind. And so, uh, you know, if you're trying to get into this exploratory mode uh, where you want to try things and, you know, throw away things and move very rapidly, uh, not having that, uh, you know, pristine code written with tests really helps you uh, get into more of an experimental mindset. Uh, you know, it also gets you, uh, you know, to think about how you will decouple things in a much more deeper and meaningful way. So that's the second reason. Uh, the third thing which uh, often people keep saying is you, you know, if to refactor code, you need tests. Uh, you cannot refactor code without tests. And this, for a lot of people, like they cannot think of refactoring their code. It's a nightmare for them. Uh, and what I discovered over, over the years is that, uh, you know, there are actually a lot of safe uh, refactoring techniques which you can still do and refactor large amounts of code. Uh, without needing any tests, it just needs you to be a uh, little bit more uh, thoughtful and methodological uh, and use the right tools. Uh, so refactoring uh, without tests is very much possible. We've done large amounts of refactoring without tests and it's, uh, you know, it's the, the earth is not stopped, uh, you know, so things can, can be quite easy. Uh, so the third point I want to make is basically uh, you know, refactoring without tests is quite possible. And sometimes actually not having tests makes you refactor in very interesting ways, which you may not have done other ways. And so that was like a aha moment or revelation for me. Uh, so I think those are the three kind of big ticket items that I would say uh, that kind of really helped me. And like I was saying earlier, uh, the contingent code is predominantly uh, does not have any tests, uh, you know, barely any tests. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's working fine. We've done lots of transactions, financial transactions, a uh, lot of systems. I'm not saying we don't have any bugs. Uh, we may have bugs, but I don't think uh, those bugs, if we wrote tests, would have uh, gone away if you, or we done TDD would have gone away. So sometimes I think it's important to kind of just step back and look at, you know, what's the benefits you're getting from TDD. And if you don't do, what are uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages? And so just keep an open mind. Don't be very dogmatic about it. Uh, these are all important tools as developers in your toolkit. Uh, use what works best in, in, in a given context. So thank you. That is uh, my uh, quick three minute on uh, lessons I learned from quitting DVD. Paul, why don't you come up? Paul, if you want to put your hands up, I'm going to pull you up. Hey, so uh, as I said, pick an argument. Yeah, you uh, want to pick small, anyway. Small stories. Uh, we should, shouldn't do Selenium testing in, in the build. What is the build? Um, plenty, plenty of things I'm ready to argue about if you uh, or ready to say something controversial about if you wanted to pick one of those or something else? Well, I've, I've been a big proponent of uh, not writing end-to-end uh, -end UI tests, uh, you know, or at oh. least drastically limiting them. I, I think I gave it a talk a few years ago about uh, Selenium detox. Uh, you know, Selenium, the term Selenium was picked up because it was to, uh, you know, it was a, uh, recipe for, mer for for mercury poisoning, uh, if right. if, and so I was kind of trying to find a reverse of now we have too much of selenium poisoning, <laughs> so we need to move away from that. Well, I mean, it's uh, so for a start, I I uh, don't like the term E to E, and uh, I don't use it end to end or E to E because every person I ask says a different thing. What is E to E, and they give me a different account. So is, is it full stack testing? Well, for some people it is, for others it's not. Um, and I don't do it. I'm going to engineer something with unit tests after compile. And then when that all passes, I'm going to follow with integration tests. And then that, those could be headless service tests. So that's you and I do those with service virtualization technologies, you know, but they seldom involve a UI aspect. Um, and then 
I'm going to bring up uh, the functional testing with Selenium or Appium or something, you know, Flutter driver in, in my new life in Flutter. Um, but I'm not going to run that against full stack. I'm going to bring up the smallest viable testable thing that I can as quickly as possible. And I mean, look, split seconds. Um, I'm going to do that on the same machine as the tests are running on. So the same local host as Selenium is running on, WebDriver. And I'm going to test something that could be in a Docker container. Or I'm going to test something that's just stood up within a JVM or a node or a, a rack or a you know Python provision that is only servicing the particular sequence of operations I want to do within the browser. And if I can, I'm not going to include the whole site. I'm just going to concentrate on the rectangle um, and leave everything else out. So I'll have need in my dev side rather than my test side, I'll have need to have set all that up so that I can go and functionally test rectangles. But I'm running Selenium now um, at three tests a second or five tests a second, depending on the technology. And I can crank through serially through a lot of tests without involving a Selenium cloud or a grid and without parallelizing. Um, and I can focus on individual things. Like if I'm testing a credit card page, I can test every single permutation that could be represented in parts in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I can test every permutation there. But what am I hitting in the tier below? It's probably not the database. It's probably something that is only stood up minimally to support the functional stories within that test sequence. And I, I would, again, do compile, followed by unit test, followed by service test, followed by these component tests using Selenium or Appium or Flutter driver. Um, and I want the whole build to be finished in one minute, all of it. Compile, unit, service, and functional tests. So you know, in that particular vision, Naresh, I don't at all ever say that was an E2E test or a representation of any E2E exercise. Each particular thing that was tested was tested directly. Like if you have to log in before you get to the credit card page, in my test suite, I'll have bypassed the login page and just load up with a cookie, the credit card page ready to go. You know, carts not filled. Pretend that I filled the cart. I'm straight on the credit card page. I'll be paying for a hypothetical cart. Um, and I'll test every single edge case that could possibly happen from there. So I, I don't say myself, I don't say E2E, and I refuse to cooperate when people start changing, having the conversation that features the expression end to end, because they don't do it. Damn it, we can't disagree with each other. We need to pick an argument here. Yep, yep. I think okay. the Angular guy started E2E. I think they uh, they coined it back in 2011 or something like that, and it's run away. People say E2E testing frameworks, and it's like nobody knows what that means. Just for the benefit of the folks uh, in the audience, uh, Paul Hammett here uh, is the co-author of Selenium. Uh, so he's someone that I would trust when he makes that statement. Uh, he's been there. He's done that. Uh, and so when he says that you know this is not what Selenium should be, uh, used for that means a lot, right? It's it's uh, it's not some Joe off the street making a statement. So I just want to clarify that. But I'm controversial in that uh, it's possible that the Selenium team themselves don't agree with me anymore. So you know, I'm happy to be in a club of one around component testing and an avoidance of E2E testing. I, I mean, from whatever my interaction with Simon and the gang, uh, I think a lot of them are, uh, you know, on similar pages, in my opinion, that they are not encouraging or pushing people to be very top heavy, if in that sense, like write a lot of uh, these Selenium tests, uh, they are actually recommending you push those tests at the lower layers of the pyramid. Uh, I stop using those some of these terms because everybody has their own interpretation of what an integration test is. You know, you ask five people and every everyone will have a very different definition of what an integration test is. Uh, so I stop using that term. It just means nonsense now. Yeah, it, 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 integration test might be easier to argue that um, you know you could say I think this means this and have a reasonable case for it, but E to E. Functional testing, you know, they're way out there now. You can't, you can't get any five people to agree on even two 
different alternates. But um, yeah, it's problematic. Uh, now, full disclosure. Do... Uh, from the audience, uh, quickly, what do they think of integration tests? If you want to just quickly type out in the chat window, what according to you is integration tests? I think it's just uh, I'm curious because every time I talk to people, I find quite different definitions of what an integration test will be. How do we get back to the chat window? Uh, just on the right, you would see the discuss. Discuss, yeah. It was Aslak. Uh, Aslak spoke maybe three years ago at Agile India. He yeah. came and, um, you know, actually did a fairly good presentation on the need for fast cycle times within functional testing suites too, using some of the techniques we're alluding to. Correct. As luck being the cucumber guy, Mr. Cucumber. Monsieur Before cucumber, cucumber. I, I remember him building this framework at one of the clients where we were. Uh, and basically, any any code that did not have tests, he basically just deleted them from the repository. <laughs> and that was, that was wicked. Uh, but I think it drove home the point that, you know, people could not just, uh, you know, throw in code. Uh, you know, like, and he was uh, talking about like this a professional malpractice, uh, and so a slack can be quite <laughs> intense. He's an extremist sometimes, right? In a good way. In a good way. All right, I, I think it's just you and me, Paul, because I don't see any interactions on the discussion. Okay. Uh, so I need some uh, discussion here. Uh, so, what do you think integration tests are? If it helps, I can uh, I can use a very cliched example that I typically use. So I have a calculator application. It has a, a calculator UI, which is basically the front end uh, where people can type in the numbers uh, and hit the equals. It also has a little display which shows the results and the numbers that you're typing in. Then it makes a service call uh, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, these days serverless is the fashionable thing. So it makes a... Uh, uh, there's a function uh, in the cloud, so it makes a call to the serverless thing that then looks up some kind of a data store uh, and then does some computation based on that and then returns the result back to you. Uh, and so you have, uh, you know, to, to keep it simplistic, you have three components, if you will, uh, at play. Uh, your UI, uh, you have your, uh, you know, the function as a service, uh, and then you have some kind of a you know data store. So, you know if if this is this is a just a typical any uh, CRUD application type thing, uh, what would be an integration test in this context? Uh, can 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 folks in the audience please type out what they think an integration test would be? So Vinaya says. Uh, Making sure these components work well together as expected. Anyone else? If you agree with that answer, do a thumbs up. Okay. And so only three people I see doing a thumbs up. Uh, what about the rest of the folks? They don't have a thumbs down feature. No, 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 no. <laughs> Give them multi choice. Thumbs up if you hate that as a definition of uh, integration tests. You hate it. <laughs> it's too abstract. I think it's fine. <laughs> Vinaya says so she did a couple of thumbs up. So it looks like it's just three of us then. Uh, Vinaya, do you want to uh, come up on stage? Yeah, hi Vinaya. Uh, great to see you again. Uh, so I think, uh, again, just uh, in the spirit of being a little controversial and having an interesting discussion here, uh, not trying to pick on anybody. But uh, what I was trying to make a point earlier is, uh, you know, the making sure the components work well together as expected uh, seems too abstract to me. Uh, so <laughs> please help me with a with an example. 
of what would be an example of an integration test in this context? Sure. So the way I'm thinking about it is that anything that has been developed separately but is meant to work together, we want to make sure that that happens. So let's say in the example that you gave of the calculator, let's say there's a UI layer and there's a host layer and the work has been done separately on those, then, and each of them works well by they themselves. They have been unit tested, so you know right. they individually right. work well. Yeah. And now to make sure that when both of these are brought together, so if I'm putting in a number from the UI, it's uh, hitting the right uh, services, returning the right responses, getting displayed correctly. So just, you know, maybe uh, taking a cut across the components, seeing if that flow works or not, I would call that an integration test. So uh, just again, trying to build on that. So you would have some kind of a test which would uh, punch in numbers into the UI, uh, would, would send the request, like would hit enter, and it right. would send the request, and then the response will come back, and you would right. uh, assert whether the response that came back is what you expected. So you sent two and three, and then you right. would was verify that five came back. Right. Uh, right. So great. Uh, now, here's here's something for you to think about right how is this now different from the other <clears throat> higher level tests like your end-to-end -end tests uh is this not a kind of a full stack test in some sense how is this different from those tests right uh so like i'm going back to my experience from many many years ago as a developer and thinking about it and i would say that maybe when we're thinking of integration we are probably focusing a little more on the interface, just that bit, and the other functionality, et cetera, maybe you know, is uh, taking a back seat. Whereas when we are looking looking at higher level functional tests, maybe we are a lot more concerned about the overall business flow, the functionality within each of the modules, you know, behaving right and all of those things. But in the integration, we uh, usually, from what I remember, we used to focus more on whether the interface whether the two components know how to speak to each other uh, the way we expect it to. Absolutely. So that's what I would prefer as, as the focus of integration tests is whether two components can talk to each other, can communicate mm -hmm. with each other. And uh, first thing is I would never assert that the response that I got back is five. Because mm -hmm. That's now functional. Uh, right. really doesn't matter if I got five back, I got six back, I got nine back, right? right. Because that is not a concern of the integration test. That is the, right. the functional aspect. Right. I would let functional tests deal with it, uh, you know, ideally at a unit level or maybe at a higher level. But certainly mm -hmm. the integration test should not be asserting, for example, what the result uh, came back as long as the result was a valid number. Or an integer would be uh, You know, yeah, that, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. The second is, uh, you know, do you want to drive from the UI in this specific case, or do you want to go to the last mile from where you're actually making the API call, like in this case? Uh, so you right. have like some kind of a client which is making an, uh, a HTTP client which is making an API call, and right. so you probably are interested in kind of uh, hitting from the HTTP layer and seeing uh, you know, if it can communicate to the right service. So there is some kind of a configuration lookup way to figure out where the server is, uh, whether you, you can connect to that, whether you're using the right protocol. So if, if your server is expecting a HTTP uh, JSON request, uh, you know, and you're sending an XML, it's not gonna work, right? So those yeah. are the kinds of things that you know, generally people talk about uh, when sure. they talk about integration tests and that's right. what is making sure that these two components that were independently developed whether mm -hmm. they talk to each other right uh, uh, while, while that's true i would just say that you know again i'm talking about history but uh, we did tend to mix the functional and the interface tests unless you know if we were, we were talking about api calls from third party vendors etc over there we knew that the functionality wasn't going to work at the first go so that was where we really narrowed it down and said that, hey, let's just look at whether the interface works and park everything else for later. But I appreciate the point you're making. Cool. Thank so thank you. Uh, I mean, I was just trying to, again, clarify that 
you know, the, the term integration tests means quite different things to different people. And now, you know, when you throw a mix of technologies into this, it could uh, further complicate things. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's quite uh, interesting to try and so I, I've now stopped using the term integration test because I think uh, people have a lot of baggage when they come with it. Uh, in my morning talk, I basically talked about unit tests, component tests, uh, up, you know, uh, uh, components like service tests, uh, uh -huh. contract tests, and oh, okay. uh, you know, uh, application tests. Uh -huh. uh, and application tests is something everyone understands, and then you know, more of uh, acceptance tests, and then. Uh, essentially shadow mode tests which you run in the production. production and those are the kind of terminologies that I seem to be sticking these days but who knows even those uh, can be problematic. So contract test is your uh, terminology of choice right now for integration tests? Uh, it's a subset in some sense mm -hmm. uh, right it, it is only verifying whether these two components are uh, you know, contractually can talk to each other and they adhere to the contract. Uh, so that's that's the terminology that we're using. It doesn't. Okay. The moment you say contract, everyone knows that you're not asserting functionality. Everyone right. knows that all you're interested in is is basically seeing if this other thing meets the contract and is backward compatible with the contract because those are the kind of important concerns uh, when you're integrating. Right. Uh, True. Because everything else I can test at a component level or at a unit level uh, in terms mm -hmm. of the functionality and other kinds of things. So I think just using that kind of a terminology has at least helped us uh, clarify some of this uh, thinking process with people. Sure. Thank you. That was very well, useful. Thank you. Yeah, I do see Shakti, uh, you're back. So I'm going to quickly invite you. Can you accept? Oh, Hello. there we go. Finally, Hi. all right. Okay, Great. finally, I'm I'm there with my Safari browser. I I'm not sure. Yeah, I think for three minutes it should work. <laughs> awesome, cool. So okay. your topic, mm. Shakti, was about personal agility. So take it away. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, yeah. Hi all. So, um, yeah, just a small uh, background about me. I'm an agile coach for working in society general. Right. So uh, we have been talking about um, agility, agile and uh, things like as such. Uh, when it comes to personal agility, um, it becomes very personal to us. Right. So um, what I'm trying to say is um, if I had a slide that I could share here, I would strike out agility and I would make it ability. Right. So personal agility is nothing but personal ability. Right. When I say ability, uh, our ability to cope up with the situation, our ability to wind up the work which we start, our ability to uh, handle the failures. Right. So these are the different um, terms we have been, uh, you know, talking about in the agile world also. Right. So when all these bo are boiled down, um, I have found out uh, that um, it's really about the mindset, right? So it's uh, we are talking about personal agility. So uh, we we have to talk about about um, mindset shift, right? Which makes us personally agile, right? So uh, there are four um, mindset shifts that um, I would like to talk about. First is self-awareness, right? So in our um, in Shane Hasty's uh, session, um, I raised a question asking, uh, how do we build a coaching um, culture, right? Uh, how do we uh, start with acceptance of people uh, to be coached, teams to be coached, uh, people to understand that, okay, it's not only me, it's, a, it's not only about me, I can take help from others and uh, I can still get the job done, right? So self-awareness becomes a very important um, aspect here um, to transform ourselves. Uh, we have to first know our um, strengths, our weaknesses, right? Are we uh, really vulnerable, which means are we ready to accept the failures? Are we ready to do the failures? Are we ready to take the risks? Are we ready to expose our limitations? 
and um, next is uh, are we do we have some limiting beliefs do we have that biases in our mind that uh, okay uh, maybe i can't do this because uh, maybe this can't happen because uh, of so and so reasons instead of uh, diving into the doing part right and uh, also we need to be um, checking our, our, on ourselves well that are we really courageous to make decisions lot of times we get then get an opportunity to uh, get that um, ownership or get that responsibility but do we really have that courage to to make decisions based on uh, our context based on our experiences ba- based on our uh feelings that we have at that moment right so when we um, assess ourselves on uh, self awareness uh, that's where we start that is that that mindset is um, the first stepping stone for uh, personal agility right so the second mindset shift that um, according to me is growth mindset right so uh if we don't know how to celebrate our failures if we don't know out of 3 minutes sorry i'll give you a oh. last minute to quickly wrap up please okay okay fine so uh, i think we know about growth mindset right so we should learn to fail and we should learn to um, learn from our failures so right so uh, so this i call as a second mindset shift for personal agility next is to have uh, to do things that really matter Uh, to be able to prioritize our work right so unless we know how to prioritize unless we know what is very important unless we know to time to do uh, the things in a timely manner uh, our agility is at stake uh, which in turn uh, hampers our abilities right um, the fourth is uh, to be innovative right uh, when i say innovative it does not mean that we uh, go down and learn Uh, the latest technologies right in our own perspective uh, how innovative are we uh, in um, completing uh, or uh, taking up the deep dive, deep dive into a new um, responsibility that we can do so these are the four mindsets that i would like to stress upon one is self awareness second is growth mindset third is um, uh, able to prioritize right fourth is to be innovative so these are the four key aspects i would call to uh, build our personal agility which in turn uh, makes us uh, personally able uh, to great. meet our goals right so yeah that's all i had all right great thanks shakti i i love the you know you should strike out the word agility and replace it with ability I think that's great. I'll steal that. <laughs> thank you. All right, I think folks, uh, thank you very much. We've run out of time.